Thank you everyone for being here. It's really gratifying to see so many familiar faces, um, not just people who were in classes with me and who we motivated each other, but um, I really, uh, for, let me start with um, Dr. Malden. Thank you for everything. She was my mentor. I was just talking to her about um, orientation and she tapped me on the shoulder and she said, did you sign up for a mentor? Well, that's me. And you've just really been with me every step of the way from when I first got into the program and just through it all and you're not rid of, rid of me after I, I, I finish. Uh, we're still family, but, um, and as well, Dr. Rothbart and um, Dr. Krug, thank you so much. The three of you with your guidance really helped me to bring coherence to this project and think through and actually apply the tools that um, I, I gathered here. Um, Dr. Averick, I'm so happy to see you. Um, no matter how busy you ever were, you always had time and sometimes you saw me in the hall and even though I, am a, I work full time and I'm not you know, in the vicinity a lot, you would just call me in your office and say, tell me about your project. I'm excited about your work. And that was just so encouraging. Dr. Lyons as well, and um, always say Dr. Agneshka, not out of a lack of, um, <laughs> of respect. It's just that Dr. Lyons helped me and you as well to say your first name. And I'm still working on the last. I apologize. So thank you all for being here. And of course, the love of my life, Kevin, who anyone who ever took a class with me heard me talk about my uh, husband. And he's the love of my life. And I told him a couple of years ago, well, several years ago now, that I wanted to conduct this research. And he says, go ahead and do it. Now, what husbands ever say that? And he just has been so patient listening to me about my papers and my theories. So thank you for being here. I love you so much. So um, obviously the title of my dissertation is Lambs of God, as seen here, and it's the untold story of black children who desegregated Catholic schools um, in New Orleans. Um, now, let me just pull apart the summary and, um, you know, to, just to summarize in general, everybody knows the word Catholic literally means universal. It means everybody welcome. And even though Catholics made that claim by name, it wasn't what was in practice because, of course, um, Catholic, the Catholic Church, when I use the Catholic Church, I mean its hospitals, its charities, its schools, the whole institution participated in slavery, um, <coughs> orders of priests and nuns owned slaves. In fact, when women entered the novice community as nuns, they often brought their slaves with them. So it didn't just abide uh, and tolerate slavery. The Catholic, Ch Catholic Church actually and actively participated in it. So after um, emancipation, the Catholic Church continued to um, participate in racial segregation. And um, this was an institutionally uh, sanctioned practice in the American Catholic Church. Even though the Vatican sent out an edict that said racial segregation is e evil and should not um, practice that. The Catholic Church in America continued to. And the reason that they could was really because um, Vatican left the decision like that up to the American Catholic Church. And it says, you know, it's evil, but you do what you do. And this is where this um, conflict starts. So what I did was explored the heretofore untold experiences of elementary school students. And I focused on the African-American students who desegregated Catholic schools. There's a lot been written about the public school desegregation and children who were kind of older. So I'm looking at the elementary level and I was looking at the student frame. And these, the youngest students, um, they were the ones who, even though as, as I'll explain later, the Catholic Church now stories itself as having walked up to and welcomed um, integration. That didn't really happen. And um, as, as you'll see, and as I found out, that narrative of what actually happened with, deseg with desegregation of the Catholic schools, um, that, that narrative has changed over the time that I've observed it, because I'm talking about events that happened in 1962. So, I found that the youngest students were agents and they really were the ones that pushed the, the uh, institution away from exclusion and toward the real meaning of the word Catholic because they went into the spaces and made integration happen. So 
um, in New Orleans it was a very uh, turbulent and chaotic desegregation process. In fact, the, the public schools had already desegregated to a lot of violence. That happened two years before the Catholic schools integrated. And a lot of people don't realize that even though there was, was violence and people watched four little girls enter the public schools in New Orleans, many people associate that with Ruby Bridges, the Catholic schools still remain segregated, racially segregated. And we're talking about a sizable school system because for Catholics, there were 70, in, in New Orleans especially, it's very Catholic and African American, a lot of African American Catholics. So the Catholic um, was 75,000 students, 12,000 of whom were African American. So there was a dual school system. It ran its a school set of schools for um, the white students and its set of schools for the African American students. And the public system was 90,000 students, 60,000 of whom were African American. So we're talking about a sizable population here. So I'm explaining what happened after the media and the protesters, because there was a lot of turbulence um, that led up to Catholic school desegregation. After that left, what did the students do to inaugurate a new um, era of equality? Because even though legislative um, change occurred, that really didn't um, affect the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church owned its own schools. They could have integrated whenever they wanted. But there were a lot of people pushing, I guess, and saying at the national, at the um, societal, at the institutional level for this to happen. Um, but desegregation arguably, arguably would not have occurred had not there been parents who were willing to send their, their children and children who were willing to go into that environment and make desegregation happen. So um, I hope to transform the way that young students are seen in the historical story of Catholic school desegregation. So um, the problem that I saw was the Catholic Church now stories itself as having courageously pushed for desegregation and welcome the students with open arms. I was a member of that group though that desegregated Catholic schools and I started seeing an incremental encroachment on that narrative. First, you know, it was about you know, the turmoil and then it got to be very sanitized is, is what I'll call it. And I looked at that as though um, it was concerning me and, and to be honest I was looking, for, waiting for someone else to study it. And uh, when that didn't happen, I figured I'd better tell this story and, and tell it from my point of view. My, I used a narrative approach, and I just wanted to give you a, just a quick example of the first person um, manner in which I write at the beginning, just so that I can convey what was going on in society at the time. I, I mean, to, just to set a backdrop, everything in Louisiana was segregated when I was young. I mean, signs told you where to sit, where you could, could and couldn't eat, um, where, where you could, there were dentists for black people and you couldn't go to a white dentist. Uh, when I rode on the bus, there was a sign that had to be moved and attached to the seat and I had to make sure that I or my sisters or whoever I was traveling with sat behind it. And I still remember there was a, I was in a grocery store one time and um, I, a woman admonished me because I was just a little kid and I went to the water fountain that um, said it was for white patrons only. And she really admonished me and told me how rude I was and that, and I was really confused because first of all, I didn't even know I was black, you know, as a young kid. I mean, you notice that some people are lighter or darker or some people have moles or freckles, but I never knew there was a thing called race and that there was a set of attributes that um, embodied race and that because of that I couldn't drink at that that water fountain. So I was very confused. So let me just read just from a, a paragraph from my dissertation, at least the draft of it. So on September 4th, 1962, five black students and I entered the first grade at St. Gabriel the Archangel on the first day of Catholic school desegregation. In that moment, my life changed. Desegregation meant I could obtain a better education. However, many in the Catholic community were not ready for people who to their minds were different and inferior. I sensed something important was going on when my father, who was normally working, drove us to school. He parked around the corner from our destination and we walked up the block toward the school. 
As we turned the corner, I could see why he had parked there. There was no place to park closer because a gauntlet of angry parents and white community members were gathered in front of the school. As we approached, people in the crowd taunted and disparaged the black children and continued while we walked up the long sidewalk to enter the school. Some shouted at us while policemen stood nearby. Some were praying the rosary together. One woman cried out in a pleading voice, don't let them in. Though ominous and frightening to see so many angry people, I could not imagine the reason for their hostility. I began to see that that experience that I had was distorted and sanitized. And so the purpose of this dissertation is to create a more comprehensive and inclusive um, story and civil rights postmortem. Why Lambs of God? Lambs of God are really prominent in the um, Old Testament. They're mentioned quite a bit. And in fact, God gave the Israelites a command to um, sacrifice a lamb. And it should, be, should not be a, a, it should be a healthy lamb, one of your finest lambs, one that you really don't want to part with because um, this was the way that they, they would show that they were sorry for their sins and they were really willing to risk something very valuable in order to be forgiven by God. And so I, my, um, well also the Catholic Church and Catholic theology and people who are Catholic uh, may um, connect with uh, in, in other religions as well, Jesus as the Lamb of God because he came to God sent him, God sacrificed his only son in order to bring um, more peace and show people how to live in love and peace. And so I'm not um, at all conflating our experiences with Jesus' life, <laughs> crucifixion, death, and resurrection. But I'm just using that metaphor to talk about the experience of, um, by the timing of our birth, we could be said to be selected by God to um, help the church get over its sin of, desegreg of segregation and exclusion. And so um, children who were the ones that were sacrificed for a greater good um, are the ones that I'm referring to as the lambs of God. Okay. Um, I conducted a literature review and in addition to the topics listed, African American education and the forming of a religious worldview, the segregation and desegregation of Catholic spaces and spheres, the use of children as desegregation agents, untold stories of the civil rights movement. I also talked a little bit in the literature review about the theories that I was going to operationalize in order to um, deconstruct um, desegregation. So my literature review really led to three points that there's a gap in civil rights history concerning the experiences of African Americans because this whole story and every all the literature and all the church archives I looked at is told from the church's lens from the leadership from the archbishops the priests um, the people who were working um, in the community it's told from that lens and I really didn't find um, evidence of well there was a real dearth of it I find a few short articles about the student lens and um, the Catholic Church contributed to the cultural trauma that um, students experience and that official church narratives really don't embody that experience of the black students. So these are my research questions. First, what did the black students who desegregated Catholic schools experience? They were charged to bring about a more unitary environment. So what did they experience in that? And second, over a period of eight years, Archbishop Rummel, the head of the Catholic Church, said that he was going to desegregate schools, and then he would reverse himself. And his main tool for doing that was pastoral letters. A pastoral letter is a letter that the Archbishop gives to all of the churches in the um, Archdiocese and says, read this to everybody at Mass. So his main tool was reading, the reading of letters at worship services. So while he sometimes in those letters was announcing desegregation and sometimes it was very short-lived because in the next letter he was reversing himself and he continually did that over an eight-year period. While he vacillated and delayed, that gave obstructionist 
the opportunity to form and to mount a strategy. And you saw this all over New Orleans, and I'll, I'll show you a picture of it. And then my last question is, what bearing did the um, anti-integration movement at large have on Catholic school students? Okay. So um, this, when the American Catholic Church participated in slavery and segregation, it engaged in what Galtung um, categorized as structural violence, and of course, thanks to Dr. Averick, I really know a lot about this. Um, it exists when because of a stratified society, the effects of historical discrimination, some groups have better access to resources and opportunities than others. So we had this structural violence in the form of discrimination, Jim Crow laws, social custom, not only in the South, but elsewhere. It wasn't really sectional, as people believe. There was um, segregation elsewhere. Cultural violence, and by that I mean the widespread attitudes and beliefs of infer inferiority um, or superiority based on uh, the personal characteristics of people. And so in this context, we had myths, we had hatreds, we had stereotypes. And of course, the outward manifestations of, of those, which is the um, rocks thrown, the sprinklers turned on, the water hoses, the harassment, the threats the school bombings. And in the context of um, Catholic school desegregation, there was a cross burned on the um, archbishop's lawn. There was harassment. There was bullying inside of the schools. There were teachers who, who were indifferent or who ver were very harsh to the African-American students. There was a school bombing of one of the Catholic churches. There were sprinklers turned on us when we were trying to get to school. And um, the white community didn't want us walking through the white community to uh, what, what used to be a white school. They would open their doors and let their dogs out when we were passing. So all of those things were forms of direct violence that occurred. Okay, so I'm not going to go certainly over all of these, but um, of course what is, not, is also um, true about these forms of violence is that they interact and they interplay and, and um, they affect each other. So I'll just go with the first one that says structural violence legitimizes its cultural forms. And by that, U.S. discrimination policies supported and legitimized the beliefs about black people being inferior. So because there were, there must be something wrong with them because there are laws against them being, being able to drink at the, from the water, same water fountain. So there must be something to it. People who are more powerful than I have made these, and so I assume that they know what they're doing. And in fact, um, people can even be glorified and applauded for protecting society against um, this by, by justifying its structural forms. Another one is direct violence can be used as a tool to maintain structural violence, and by that, I meant that attacking students was a tool to induce them to leave. The, the teachers who were indifferent to us, the bullying that went on in school, well, we'll have segregation endure by um, making sure that direct, we, we, we will mount attacks with direct violence. So this is what we experienced and um, I applied it to Catholic school desegregation. So I already mentioned Galton's violence triangle and I also um, contributed to Yuri's uh, work on parties because I came up with what I believe is a different classification of um, conflict party, which is the sacrificial lamb. And I'll tell you about those characteristics on another slide. Collective axiology. This is a focus on a system of values that establish membership, who's in the in-group and who's in the out-group. This I apply to understanding the segregationist mentality. Cultural trauma theory, well, I kind of borrowed that from social science, and I, what this really did, um, it has a rooting in group or collective memory. So the students kind of remembered. We all had a common memory of something happening, and you know, by the way, it really didn't match what we've been hearing about. But there's memory, and it's a remediated experience, one that we had told each other about, one we told our children about. When we talk to my sisters, we talk about this. I talked to my friends who I just saw at a, a party for one of them um, over the weekend, and we, we talk about what we went through. And um, of course, critical race theory, which
applies a racial lens more broadly to these, um, these types of events. Uh, critical race theory focuses on things like the artificiality of race and uh, white privilege. My data, let's see, I collected a lot of data. I wanted about six to ten participants, but I rang up a few and through snowballing and word of mouth, I have plenty of participants. Ultimately, I, ident I identified 18. I scheduled interviews and um, part of what I wanted to do with my interviews and narrative was to elicit themes and, and identify turning points. And, and also, though, to figure out who was in power, who had agency, how did these things li link together. Um, as I said, I'm a member of the group and autoethnography allows you to be both a member and a researcher. So, um, a, S, a SCAR PhD uh, interviewed me and my, um, my interview became part of my research. But I also used a journal and reflective practices as well. And then um, I had a wide assortment of artifacts that I viewed from the time. Uh, brochures, pamphlets, f photographs, speeches, um, I spent a lot of time at Tulane University looking in their archives on Catholic school desegregation. And then I conducted case studies. So I looked at other archdioceses that desegregated around the same time, Miami. And then there were three that worked together, Charleston, Savannah, and Atlanta. They worked in coalition. So I, con I conducted process tracing to um, find out what they did because they had nonviolent outcomes. So I wanted to know um, what they had done. All right, so I won't pack, unpack all of, <laughs> this is um, almost an eye chart, but <coughs> these are the people I interviewed. There were 18. Um, I found that there were a couple of light complexion students who no one, when they were admitted to um, schools before they desegregated, no one knew they were black. Now the school knew they were black, but they um, admitted some light complexion, non-identifiably black uh, children into at least one school before desegregation began. Um, the Lambs of God, those were the elementary schools that I, I'm students that I'm a part of. There were high school students. D plus three is discrimination plus three, so I talked to some people who were enrolled maybe three years after discrimination had occurred to see what was the difference in their um, experiences. And then parents, who I'm referring to as knowing and trusted others, and I use that in my um, my classification of conflict parties. So I found two parents. So my um, age range was anywhere from late 50s to the parents were 84 and 86 years old who participated in this study. So this isn't my school, but this is another school that desegregated. And I'll just let, leave this here to give an illustration of what did occur uh, on September 6, 1962 in New Orleans. And I, I used some of these photos to not, not necessarily these, but others, to, to read what the segregationists were saying and didn't have access to them, so that was part of their narrative. All right, so I coded my interviews, and here is, are the examples of the, and it's just is very condensed because there were v many, many more. The, some of the um, ideas that came in the statements that came out of my interviews I'll just go through one, and they all lead to the experiences of African-American students who desegregated Catholic schools. So we experienced something together. Again, that's an aspect of collected memory. We all remember something that we experienced together, and, and collected memory you know, exists whether or not the students are there. Um, it's something that occurred. It's something that exists. It's part of cultural trauma theory. So in that sense, in the same manner, you can see how I looked at how some students were admitted because they looked white. Of course, that has to do with the artificiality of race. I mean, were they black or white? Were they subordinate or not? Were they acceptable? Were they, you know? But um, they paid tuition, so there was an advantage to bringing them in. And also, they could, it could kind of quell the consciousness of people who said, no, we're not racist. We have two black students in the school. Nobody can pick them out, but we have, <laughs> have two black students. Nobody knows who they are. Students don't know, teachers, community. And I wanted to just present this one because 
this is what ended up being um, the classification of conflict party that I'm suggesting started. So I started seeing these examples. My parents wanted to desegregate another space in New Orleans. Well, that seemed linked to something called should be done for a greater good. I had no idea there was anything about, I didn't know I was black, I didn't know there was a conflict, but I just went to school because my parents packed my lunch and told me to go. And so that was innocence. Social isolation, no one would touch me, no one would talk to me, no one would play with me. And so I, those themes started congealing together into what I'm calling the a new classification of conflict party, which is a sacrificial lamb. It's somebody who doesn't know about the conflict, find them, finds themselves there. They're sent by people who they trust, the knowing trusted other. There's not, there's not preparation of the um, teachers or whoever is supposed to be their allies. And so this is a new classification. I just took a picture of my notebook because I I'm not the best at reflexivity, but you know. Dr. Shoney is and <laughs> Dr. Malden is and so I, I, I learned to do that and I'm telling you it really paid off because this is where that started to formulate for me those same things and you can I just you know when I started looking back at it I saw the themes they just were starting to jump off the page and I started writing things like strategic racialization and oh that is um, critical race theory and then I started saying well no that's really acknowledgement of privilege you can see, but it all just came together in my notebook through reflective practice. So I had a rich assortment in terms of agnostic of, of things that I viewed, and I'm not going to unpack them again. I'll just mention there was a children's mo ma module that segregationists were spreading out around at that time in schools to teach um, young children about a narrative that I'm going to talk to you about. There were speeches, brochures, there's a handbook on Catholic school segregation and it, it really is revealing in terms of what they were talking to the Catholic community about. And of course there were pastoral letters. Okay, so for process tracing, um, what Miami did that I thought was that it really got the community ready for se desegregation. They used um, interracial um, curriculum and put those in the schools so that the, the students knew that the African American students were coming and what that meant. So they applied some resources to this social change. They didn't just, uh, you know, frankly lecture people through pastoral letters. They also were involved with the larger civil rights movement in Miami. They and the coalition by, of Charleston, Savannah, Atlanta, they uh, entered in partnerships with the media and ask them, please don't sensationalize these students, please don't put the students' names, you know, please don't follow the students and the families around. Why don't we just play it low key? And the Archbishop of Miami even prevailed on them by saying, you know, it might affect tourism if you do that. So they used a lot of other strategies, not just the issuance of pastoral letters. So what I looked at was the inputs, which maybe were interracial study circles for example, the outputs, um, you know, a printed curriculum that they, that fanned out across um, their, their diocese. What the outcomes of that were and what the impact. And of course the main impact was whether or not there was a violent outcome. Now, of course, there, there was some protesting that occurred in Atlanta. Um, and the, the African American community was off put a little bit in Miami, well, quite a bit in Miami and Savannah because what they decided to do was close the black schools down entirely and that created some bitterness. But there was not violence. There was a community dialogue going on. There, there were people who were interacting at a lot of different levels and mo most importantly, there was preparation of the students and there was preparation of the teachers um, and the community so that um, the same harassment didn't occur. In Atlanta, there was some harassment, but it wasn't in the tech Catholic schools. It was when they would go and the basketball team would go play with another school and they hadn't been prepared. That's, and, and they found that those students would even work to protect the African-American students because the archdiocese had worked on preparation of the community. They instilled some collective uh, community practices. Now, um, since I was a member 
of the um, group. Um, well, I already said I maintain a journal and um, I wasn't even in the mode of uh, looking for things. I'll just say they jumped out at me so it was a really good um, practice. For validity, I know a lot of people from the community so I had a good pool of people. Now there were only five in first grade at my school but um, across the whole system there were others and so um, that's how I got to 18. The experiences are personal. They weren't all positive, so I thought people might be constrained a little, but they weren't. Um, I also thought that it was a long time ago, so people might not remember, but it was very much in their minds because they've talked about it, they've thought about it, they have pictures of it. Um, so that wasn't a concern. They um, remembered. And I used verbatim transcripts throughout and I asked the participants to review those transcripts to make sure that I was getting them right and offer me feedback. I also had one of the Lambs of Gods to look at my coding. And she went through all of my coding. And we, there were very few discrepancies and those that we did have, we just, you know, I, I listened to her side, she listened to my side and we worked them out. And this ensured that I captured, captured the stories and um, checked my own biases. And as well, um, positionality. I really went deep into my own experiences, but um, I think my varied data sources gave me the opportunity for triangulation and I could um, ensure that I was um, getting this story straight. And I, for ethics, I bore in mind that my story was linked to other people and so I was careful not to talk about stories that made people identifiable, whether they were teachers or um, parishioners or church pastors. So um, I'm not going to go through this, but this just basically shows that um, through all of my activities, I covered all of my research questions. So through the literature review, one, two, and three are captured as well as my data collection. Um, so I already told you that I looked at a speech. It was delivered by Tom Brady, and that was really the root of the segregationist movement. And so it's a speech called Black Monday, and it really was responsible for galvanizing people who were in desperate states in the South, disparate states in the South, who didn't really consider themselves but uh, part of one community. But this speech told them, you know why we're all the same? Because we're all Southern and we're all white. This is why whether you're rich or poor, whether you're powerful or disenfranchised, you need to gather together and fight this thing called integration. And he was successful in galvanizing about um, 250 to 300,000 people to action. And it was called the Citizens Council of America. And it went by a lot of different names, even uh, the chapters. One even was the Association of Catholic Laymen. So they reflected a lot of affinity groups, but together they were the Citizens Council of America. I talked about the children's module that they planted in schools. I looked at words on the signs of people who were protesting and I looked at um, what some of these powerful people were saying to the Catholic community um, in speeches. So what I found was components of that narrative, that Brady narrative, that Black Monday speech, and it was called Black Monday because he gave the speech and talking about the Brown versus Board of Education decision which came out on a Monday and he called that a Black Monday. So it's known as his Black Monday speech. And the components of the speech were white supremacy, sectionalism, and you know, very crafty wording with pseudoscientific terms and uh, theological, a little bit justifications. They were saying, you know, we're really not prejudiced. This isn't about race. This is really about morality and protecting the world from unclean um, African American people who probably are going to pollute our gene pool and uh, not only dull our race, but um, as we look into the future, we're just going to see a lot of brown skinned people on our property and it just created a terrifying vision of the future. Um, I wish I had more time to unpack the sexual racism that was in it and um, civil rights as a communist ploy, but you know, that was a time in America where these communism was um, very much being um, hyped as something, um, it, you know, it's, a, it's a whole <laughs> new discussion manipulated health statistics, really skewing health certificates, uh, and making it very difficult for African Americans, for example, to get marriage license, and then so saying they must be immoral, because look at how many of them are living out of wedlock and having children out of wedlock. 
and morality became a proxy for race. So this is how the narrative went. Communists are out to destroy America. Communists seek to make America weak. They're going to weaken it through race mixing. School desegregation in race mixing. Therefore, school de desegregation will destroy America. And I looked at some of, I looked at uh, a Catholic school integration handbook and you can really see they are talking about these topics, again, kind of in a passive way in a pamphlet, but this is what they, the, the objections they felt that they needed to overcome. And when you look at the speeches being made, all of them had elements that you see in this narrative very strongly. They were following this narrative. And I talked about um, collective axiology and it was a way to help me to understand um, how segregationists were uh, viewing, able to um, really convince people to come on with their ideology. Um, this showed that there was a well-defined, detailed, and consistent perspective on African Americans. It was created through that whole uh, Brady narrative. And um, in its extreme form, of course, um, a low axiological balance is correlated to exaggeration, inflation, fabrication of the outgroup vices and the in-group glories. So, you know, the view of other, um, meaning the white view of black people, was a vile, sickle cell, disease, criminal, oversex. And the view of self, of course, was unstand upstanding and really trying to fight for the preservation of the future, not just of the South, but of America. And if there was anything that I could find that um, on the, the view of African Americans that was a high balance and low generality was that black people can sometimes be kind. And you know, the church could have really directed its efforts to something more than pastoral letters that helped to create this axiological balance, but they didn't. So I already said that these themes came out of my interviews students. And so these are the parties that I um, identified that I wanted to propose. The sacrificial lamb, which is innocent, unaware, um, sent to carry a message or to bring in uh, freedom or peace. And the knowing and trusted, trusted other. They don't embrace the lamb. They decide to send them into the conflict because it's going to serve a greater good. So the white there might might be putting them on a sacrificial altar. We're going to go as far as we can with you. We're going to try to make it as comfortable. Hopefully they'll see that you're a pretty good lamb and they don't want to cut your head off. But, you know, I'm, I'm exaggerating, of course, because um, these were the parents. But they, um, they, they're the ones who've taken a stand in the conflict. And the, they believe that the threats that the lamb is going to face are probably going to be worth um, the greater good. In this case, it was desegregation. So. I kept testing my um, metaphor with the students who were not identifiably white, I mean black, with the Lambs of God, with the high school students, and with the students who desegregated um, Catholic schools three or more years after desegregation. And really the only ones that fit all the criteria of that are really the Lambs of God, the ones who um, were unaware of the conflict. So um, in my, again, um, the, the remarkable thing about um, this is that in the desegregation of Atlanta, Charleston, and Savannah, they decided to work together. And in so doing, they really used journals and helped each other and called each other a lot. Um, and desegregation in Miami, uh, one thing that's remarkable is as soon as the archbishop there announced it, he desegregated the schools. It just didn't last over periods and years. Um, okay, so I looked at all the inputs and outputs and really what was key is look at all the outputs here that the other archdiocese engaged in. And for New Orleans, it was really primarily pastoral letters. So um, those are all codes that come out of my um, coding of my, um, I, I read a lot these other archdioceses. And then the main impact, there was no violence in any of, there was a little bit of picketing, as I said, but not really violence. So the only place that there was violence was really in New Orleans. And it seems to be a clear 
association with the lack of inputs and outputs and the violence that occurred. Okay, so my findings were that Catholic schools, students who desegregated the schools, they experienced cultural trauma. And cultural trauma really, to just break the concept up a little bit, is, um, so for example, in, uh, after slavery and emancipation, blacks thought, okay, we're Americans, we're gonna all be citizens, we're all gonna be equal. And they came to the realization that, well, that really wasn't the case. There were really kind of two Americas. There was a black America and a white America, and there was, there was segregation. And something similar happened here. Because the schools desegregated in 1962, and that wasn't the breach. The breach was when the Catholic um, schools failed to prepare the community for change. So there was an espoused unified community that was going to result, and everybody thought, my parents thought, we're going to go into that, and we're going to come out as one school community. But after they failed to prepare the community and the students, the students came to the realization that we're really not part of a school community, and that's what cultural trauma is, is all about. And Catholic school students did experience that. And I also found a divergent narrative. So for example, um, this is the church narrative, and this would be the, what the black students said. So on the subject of when is the conflict resolved, the church said, oh, we integrated the schools. We're done. But the Lambs of God narrative was really the church integrated the schools, but then the conflict for us just kind of was just starting. Um, the core issue, according to the church, was they worked hard and finally gave their black members equality. And the black students were like, well, we were equal all along. We, you didn't have to make us equal. You shouldn't have ever acquiesced to slavery. Um, because if, because we, we are all equal. Um, memory. The um, Catholic Church probably hopes, well, nobody really thinks about this too much anymore. And the black students are like, oh no, we've, we've all talked about this my entire life. People can attest that for me, and I'm very grateful that people have been uh, patient to under, understand that this is something that occurred that I've had to talk about. So, of course, transitioning from models of, of violence to models of peace. Um, this would be the, the ultimate, which be, would be the existence of policies and practices that support equality and oneness. And I'm not sure the Catholic Church is there yet, because um, my research showed that um, Catholics can still go to um, some churches and feel like they're just not really part of things. There are people who don't really want to shake their hand, don't really want to interact with them. And the church could take a lot more active steps to bring about more equity and oneness. Of course, from cultural violence to peace, that would be mutually beneficial relations between people. Um, if the church has done that, it has not been in response to this particular conflict, is what um, I learned. And then direct peace would be um, diversity and a universal church where everybody really feels welcome and everybody is welcome for full, full participation. And I would say that can still depend on what church you you go to, but in terms of the church writ large, probably not there. And also, I don't think that the activities that they put in place have been in direct <coughs> response to the cultural trauma that black students experience. So, second finding was that New Orleans Catholic leadership did focus on di direct violence and they delayed desegregation, during which time they let people mount an aggressive campaign that made it even worse. Integration resistors, <coughs> not just in the Catholic sphere, but their direct and culturally violent acts prolonged segregation in the Catholic schools. And that child agents of change, those sacrificial lambs, they don't want medals and accolades or recompensation or um, they don't want to get back at the church. What they really want to know is, okay, we made a sacrifice. What happened? You know? They just want to know, what, what did the church change as a result of us going through what we did? So, um, you know, in Psalm, um, there's a, um, a verse in Psalm that says, the stone that the builders rejected became the cornerstone. And it really relates to, in biblical times, that 
the cornerstone was very important to any structure. It had to have the lines. It had to be placed exactly right. If it wasn't, everything would fall over. So I use that analogy in terms of the black students being early on rejected. A lot of times they rejected a lot of stones, only to return to one and figure it was perfect for the job. Catholic school, black Catholic school students were rejected by their church. But when the church started grasping for ways to end its sin of its segregation and become a universal church, which is the very meaning of the word Catholic, it really relied on those students who went into the schools and by their example, by their grades, by their behavior, by their conduct, to show that the races could be educated and, and um, in peace together. And so, indeed, the stone that the builders rejected became the cornerstone. And these are my references. Subject to your questions. Ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Lyons. Thank you, Dr. Averett. Thanks for being here. Uh, I think what I'll ask are the, my colleagues on the uh, committee to ask questions first. Yeah. Spencer, you want to? Sure. Thank you so much. Thank you. What? First, I just want to say I much you enjoyed reading it. And I've done some, a lot of um, reading about desegregation outside the Catholic Church. And I think your analysis is an interesting and important one for us to understand. And to work to. Yes. Um, one of the questions that struck me as we were looking at the comparison between New Orleans and the other cities and the fact that it was smoother in the other cities, I wondered how much the outside communities, the public schools, struggles with desegregation impacted how smoothly it went in those cities. Because I think there is a correlation if things are not as bad in that city, then it won't be as bad in the Catholic Church. I just wondered if you saw that connection as well as you were in the comparison between the two. Yes, sir. And also the, the public schools as well desegregated at different times. And in some of those examples of the other coalitions, they actually joined with and said, we're going to desegregate at the same time and take advantage of scale of um, operations and in um, logistics and people involved. And they, they did it in tandem with the public schools as well. So yes, sir, that was that element. Mm -hmm. So is that a different cultural perspective? And those things that are different in New Orleans, why did New Orleans look to that? Um, look to, well, the archbishop kept saying he was, in the case of New Orleans, that he was going to. In fact, the archbishop said, I'm going to desegregate before the public schools. but. I just think the limit of thinking about pastoral letters and not ways to engage more interactively with the larger community uh, really was at the root of it. And I think that's what you're talking about. Um, yeah, there, there just was not that engagement with the larger civil rights movement. And, and in fact, there was some um, notion that the church really shouldn't be involved, that that state business you know, that's a public sphere. Separation of church and state, that, that's really not our business. Um, and I, I, it almost looked to people externally, though, as though it was a, um, a stall tactic, you know. Yeah, we're going to do it, we're going to do it. Oh, OK, well, they did it. Well, we're, we're about to get around to that. Yeah. One other question that I'll ask. As you talk about sacrificial lambs and the fact that so many did not know what to expect going into it. Is that a critical element to the sacrificial lamb? I just wonder because even if you prepare, it doesn't change things, does it really? Does it, or does it make you not a sacrificial lamb? I'm trying to understand. I think you're about that uh, description that you're creating the criteria for it. Okay, so the sacrificial lamb in terms of their innocence and knowing about. Yeah, one of your lines. Uh, definition yes, was that they weren't aware of what they were going into. Yes. And I'm just wondering, so if you know what you're going into, you're no longer a sacrificial lamb. Yes. <laughs> I think um, if you really take the metaphor to its most logical extreme, usually sacrificial lambs just are led by the shepherd or whoever up, up to the altar, the sacrificial altar. 
the only reason they're really going is because they trust the shepherd. They really don't know what the scene is going to be or what's about to happen there. Um, so I found that that characteristic was key to the sacrificial lamb not, not knowing. Because you do have one or two students who did know in your bottle. Did you take them out then? Those were only the high school students who knew. So yes, they, they were not um, part of the sacrificial lamb group. I, had a, I put those in the high school students uh, because they were, as you're saying, the high school students were aware. They weren't innocent. They probably had made up their mind about what side they were on and sides they were taking. In fact, one of my high school students, as you well know, um, decided not to desegregate. She just said, I'm just not going to do it. The Catholic Church got themselves into this jam, and so now they want me to get them out? No thanks. So that level of knowledge is something that the elementary school students, I guess I'm saying, didn't have. So I can, I can back up to that no, slide, but right. okay. I, it was just yeah. One of the things that threw out of my head, I wanted to ask you about. Yes. Um, well, uh, I have to just say, this is really a pleasure for me uh, to see your progress over two years from the course that we took, yes. we took yes. uh, where you were kind of at the early stages of framing your dissertation. Yes. Um, so from a teacher's standpoint, this is a happy moment. I have to just okay. say, so that's a personal. <laughs> Thing. We're not supposed to be personal here, right? Oh, okay. So I violated whatever <laughs> unwritten norm here. Um, so I'm going to make suggestions about how you transition your dissertation to a book. Okay. okay so I'm going to make suggestions, speaking to you as a professional uh, scholar researcher. Okay. Yes. So Thank you. first, um, the empirical question of I did get a sense, and again, as you move forward, again, all of this is to frame as you move forward with your publication. Yes. So I did get a clear sense of what the status was uh, before 1962, um, so historically. Now I know you did say you had the point that uh, the Catholic Church portrayed a unified vision, peaceful, so I, I don't know what other words you want to add to that, you know, in terms of their propaganda. I would call it propaganda. You didn't use that word, but I think that's appropriate. Um, but I didn't get a sense of how, what African Americans thought in the 50s. I mean, obviously, and I, I don't know the details, I'll defer to Dr. Crew on this and, and the others. Um, you know, there, were, there was so much going on in the 30s and 40s and 50s and so I, I don't know how that in, was realized in New Orleans. So I think that might be okay. good to add. Okay. Okay. To yes. giving a fuller historical picture. So not just to say this all the conflict started with resistance to integration in 1960. Yes. Okay. So I that, understand. I think that would be helpful. Okay. Thanks. Um, do, do you have that information or do you? Um, do you mean um, their perspective? Sure or what uh, the um, situation was like in terms of uh, what they thought about the Catholic school integration? What, well, what African Americans, yeah, what African Americans thought about the Catholic school segregation. About its segregation. About its segregation. Yes. Uh, I have a little bit in my literature review, but yeah, in the future I could yeah. elaborate on that a little bit more. That would be really interesting Okay. To see see that, and that would really sharpen the contrast to mm -hmm. the propaganda. I mean, if they thought, you know, if they were not, uh, quote, satisfied or whatever, again, I don't know, but that yeah. would be good. Too. They weren't, there, there were a lot of other aspects of it. For example, even seating in, in churches was segregated based on race, and people felt very humiliated by that. Uh, exactly. That's and there were exactly. Catholic churches in worship service, and white um, Catholics 
got communion, served communion, and after everyone was served, then the black parishioners could be served communion. So you had these, I'm assuming, these scenarios, these humiliating or whatever. Yes. You know, what was the reaction to the, the norm of the lived space in which they had to navigate? And yeah. the fear, whatever, whatever those emotions were. Mm -hmm. um, was it traumatic? I, you know, so those kind of questions I think would be helpful. Okay. And yes. related to that, um, what was the what was the African American community influenced by the civil rights movement in the fifties? You know, again before sixty two. You know, put it at a kind of cultural communal mm -hmm. level. Yes. Um, I did in part use um, Dr. King's speech from the Birmingham jail where he was really chastising the whole religious community for not Absolutely. really being on board Absolutely. with it. And, and, and to your other point, yes, black people really felt like, um, of, okay, yeah, we, we believe it. Catholic faith is the way to heaven, well, salvation. Okay. And so, but now you're asking me to choose between my dignity and my faith, yeah. you know. So I'll sit in the back of the church, I'll, you know, won't be welcome in the church activities, you know, because I have to do this because I, I want to I want to go to heaven. Yeah. So that's a yes. Great sir. narrative. I mean that because that's such a personally it's a felt uh, experience that's so politically charged. You mm -hmm. know, it's charged with kind of power differential, obviously. Yes. Um, second point is um, I I would suggest so you have this, <laughs> you know. Beautiful structure for, you know, that's what us professors love to see. You have this, you have the theory, you have this, you have the data, you have the, you know, analysis. And, okay, so as you move forward as a professional, you definitely need to blend it more. Okay, so what I mean is, for example, um, rather than having, there's a kind of, as I read it, it's a kind of like, here's theory and here's the analysis, here's the data and here, here's the analysis. Mm -hmm. And so what, what's a smoother way to do it is you use the terms of the theory in your analysis. Okay, okay? and I, didn't, I don't think I kind of caught that. So when you are analyzing the testimony and conveying your themes, which you summarized here, you had the concepts and the, the list of concepts that you said, oh, the interview coding. Okay, so insert the theory terms. Okay, so here is uh, uh, cultural trauma. So, so I didn't see that in the mm -hmm. analysis. And it's just, I know that it's obvious, but it, it makes it just, um, it makes it more, it, what you're doing there is combining very concrete experiences with a vision, a broader vision. You know, so yes. this is this is trauma. Okay, this is trauma. The, the, and the, the challenge with trauma, of course, is you don't see tra trauma is not something you can feel. I mean, mm -hmm. directly. It's not something you can touch. But in your testimony, oh, it's perfect. It's just great. Mm -hmm. You know, if you just say that. So that makes the theory more riveting. It makes it more grounded in life's experience when it's blended. Because okay. the theory is just a set of ideas that you use for analysis. That, that is the only value of a theory in, in, in your type of work. Okay. So I would suggest blending that. And in terms of, in addition to the blending theme, um, you definitely need to uh, give more of your personal voice. Definitely. Um, and uh, the tone here was not like riveting, you know, it's not like Ta-Nehisi Coates, you know, I mean, you're, you're being the objective uh, social scientist, which is great. I mean, that's, that's terrific. Um, but you're, you, you definitely should use the I. I saw this. And wherever you captured the testimony, you know, when you had some of these riveting testimony, like the teenage girl you mentioned, who said, I'm not going to go there, that's their problem, and that's really, that's such a felt, real uh, experience, which any parent could imagine, you know, or I would fear if I was in that situation mm -hmm. with a child. 
Um, uh, if you had any personal experience that's similar to that, you just put it in. Okay, you just can add it and say, you know, say, well, here's what this person said, but, oh, and by the way, I, have, I witnessed this. I, I know that the, you know, that was a teenage girl, you were much younger, but I witnessed, for example, the taunting, or you just mentioned the, shot, the uh, water you know, sprinkler systems. Yes. Um, you definitely need to put that, and you could definitely write in the first person. Okay. I mean, I think it's 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 pretty standard in anthropology, okay. um, and, um, and and other other. Things. Okay. Um, so, uh, um, and then the, the final my final point is that um, again you had uh, I like how you had the concept. It's also analytically neat, which you know makes academics really happy. Uh, but in terms of professional writing for a broader readership, I would suggest that you think about visualizing the concepts. In other words, you have your interview coding, um, and I I forgot, sorry, uh, visualizing, oh, in particular, the location of concepts outside of the direct violence. That is particularly riveting in your case, because you know, we have some familiarity with the direct violence that you mentioned, the bombings and so on. What I think is original um, is that you are revealing scenarios behind the scenes. You know, it's kind of like Goffman behind the scene mm -hmm. type of thing. It's the invisible. And to really bring that out as here is where the conflict exists. It exists in the homes of the children where the parents are arguing with the children mm -hmm. or or maybe not mm -hmm. it exists you do mention the white council you know what it exists in the in the controversy among the white council members and maybe the town the town leaders um, it exists um, in the um, um, it, it, among the teachers what was mm -hmm. going on if you have any information about the conversation among the teachers, or it certainly exists in the classroom. Okay. So in other words, I'm suggesting that you, you have your data, and maybe you can bring out a more visualized, sharper focus that you um, can uh, see this is where the conflict is lying behind the scenes mm -hmm. of the direct violence. Mm -hmm. It's here, it's here, it's here, it's here. Mm -hmm. and. Um, you have enough data, I think, to to organize it that way. Um, yes. And particularly what's interesting within the schools, how did the teachers, you know, react? Uh, were were they all flagrantly race? You know, would you use the word race? You know, it depends what word you want to use there. That's obviously up to you. Yes. Yeah, whatever you think. Mm -hmm. is um, I I um, understand. I didn't get too much today into my chapter on the interviews where I really did talk about that teenage girl and my experiences and um, what people saw and heard inside the schools and how teachers interacted with them and how other children did and how the neighbors did. Um, it was more in a you know clinical way like participant yeah. one said and participant yeah, yeah, yeah. two said. That, so, uh, but I do understand um, what you're talking about moving to the future, y making that, um, you know, something that is more giving a peek behind the curtain of right. a sphere that people really didn't have. They, they weren't a witness to, but we were a witness right. to it and we can describe right. what was going on behind those scenes. That's right. That's yes. right. And that it was very contentious among people, maybe even among the white teachers. I, I don't know. But yes. So. Um, Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Okay. I agree very much. But part of what I, I would encourage you to do as well is my sense is that there's a great richness in the narratives that you extracted from the interviews. And they've begun to touch on it, but there's some really wonderful additional pieces of information that you can extract from that and fold into as you go forward. Because okay. I think you have tapped a, uh, 
unrevealed set of sources that will be important for people who read what you've written later on to know more about it to understand. I think it adds to what you're, you're saying in terms of the, what people can learn personally from what happened to new level individuals uh, making those narratives a larger, richer part of the story going forward. Because you're working at it and you're working as a social scientist, but I think there's some really wonderful piece of information there that need to be brought forward, as well as the research you did for the um, goes of post segregation. I think the book that you found and the research you did in that area is groundbreaking. And you really want to also bring that forward as a companion to have people better understand why there's this uh, deep seated resistance mm -hmm. to very straightforward kind of activity. Okay. Thank you. I will I will try to do that. Yeah. I will do that in the future. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Bob. I uh, second everything you said. And in terms of the segregation of literature. That stuff is off. I mean, it is beyond anything awesome. And who knows about that? And it is so blatant. It is just stunningly blatant and very blatant. So that, I think that's something that would be that have involved. You know, that this is some of the stuff that was part of that. So, and you did, you've done a stellar piece of work here. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank um, you. One, I just, one question in particular. You use the word peacekeeping in reflection of your interview death. Yes. So can you talk to me just a bit more about what you were thinking there? <laughs> Somehow I just knew you were going to ask you me that. <laughs> yes. Um, well, I, I really searched for that term and that I landed on peacekeeping. <laughs> but it more was a question of um, the realization that there was a need for peacekeeping that there were no peacekeeping forces there was no sense of personal safety that the you know the ground that we the way we understood it was had, had shifted and uh, for example I some of my interviews talked about um, students who misbehaved or bullied and and teachers who ignored it or um, punished both parties when the black student said I didn't have anything to do with this except for being here and being black. So it was more a sense of, and I searched around for terms and I landed on peacekeeping. So that's what um, I meant in terms of the term peacekeeping. <laughs> so that is something to think about and how that weaves together with mm -hmm. some of the things that um, my colleagues have. Okay. Okay. That is Good. a sense of almost desperation. Mm -hmm. Now. Yes. He's going to back me up. And the answer is no one. Nobody. Mm -hmm. Or whatever. So that's okay. Okay. So we have a few minutes. I'd like to open. Yeah. May oh, I just, yes. just add a very quick point? If, if you reminded me, I had just one more point. So, in terms of moving forward, would you, and, and I'd like you just to consider advocacy. Um, in terms of reconciliation, would you advocate for like something like a truth commission um. uh, about the Catholic Church? I mean, because this is a very current topic, mm -hmm. obviously, that we all know mm -hmm. um, from Black Lives Matters and many others are advo yes. uh, strong advocacy, which mm -hmm. I totally support for a truth and reconciliation commission yes. about race in America generally. So would you, you know, advocate something like mm -hmm. that? Yes, yeah, sir. As, as you may not remember or may, but y you know, when I was taking 900, I was kind of there cognitively, but then after talking to my interview subjects, they are so interested in um, what were the results of the sacrifices they made that I see myself directing energy to that um, because it seems like the sacrificial lamb they're not bitter, they just want to know. I've made a huge sacrifice in my life. Okay. It really affected me for the rest of my life. I don't want a medal for it. I don't want, um, you know, 50 acres and a mule, 40 acres and a mule. What I really would like to know is, what did the before and after picture look like? Okay. And, okay. and also some, you know, to, to uh, borrow a, a Catholic term, some type of act of contrition that seems as though it's a, um, connected to the original sin. There have been a lot of good works 
done by the Catholic Church, but they don't seem at all connected or directed. In fact, the Catholic Church seems like it's kind of distanced itself from this conflict, almost hoping that people will just, you know, let it go and forget about it. And so I, as I conducted my um, field work, I became more energized around those two concepts. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thank you. So but thank you. Is, is it not clear to me what it would be an action that you feel would help to resolve the conflict that the group will? I mean, I, I thought the commission was interesting, but you pushed mm -hmm. that aside. So I'm, that, that was sort of what struck me here, too. Mm -hmm. So what is the action that would make the sacrifice feel like it's worthwhile? Yeah. Um, I think there would have to be work around that that involved the Catholic Church, maybe even illuminating some things that we're unaware of that it did as a direct result of the segregation of its Catholic schools. I had been Catholic my whole life and I still am and I don't know anything and neither did any of my interview subjects. So, you know, to kind of working together on that, I'm not sure where it would go, but maybe the um, the community of students working with the church could kind of define what that was. What are the linkages between, you know, what the Catholic Church has done since and what its original sin was? Because um, an act of contrition and a perfect contrition is, you know, you express godly sorrow for your sin. I'm not just sorry that I offended black people. I'm sorry that I offended God. And so I am you know, <laughs> resolving to make things different in the future. And this is what I'm going to do as a result of that sin. And I don't think there is a record of that, you know, that, that I could find or that anyone, if, if we're all Catholic that, you know, I interviewed and none of us could detect it, I just have a feeling it's, you, you know, it's, it's, it's in such a uh, hidden place <laughs> that not many people know about it or it may not exist. What if there's no contrition? What if there's no contrition? Well. People aren't always contrite. So That's right. So I think it becomes a question of raising awareness of what the sin resulted in. Because right now they may be under the impression that there were no results. So maybe, maybe it's just uh, creating capacity within the Catholic community to understand this and be aware of it. And, um, and, and the other thing that they were really more interested in is they felt as though if there was an accounting of what happened and there were some you know, um, actions that were taken connected to it, there's uh, less of a chance of groups that feel marginalized in the church uh, feeling that in the future. They don't want other people to feel that. And people can, maybe other groups that are emerging can still go to the Catholic Church and feel that they are not part of things or they're not welcome. But that's a good thing to think about. Do you have some things to think about? I do. <laughs> Thanks. You all have given me so many things to think about <laughs> for the past couple years. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, thank you very much, and I apologize that we have not met before. We Christy haven't. Christy Jones, one of the um, PhD cohorts that came in last year. Okay, um, I remember and seeing I your bio. Looking at domestic race I saw that. And um, in response to some of the questions that your panel said, all I can say, I'm a newly converted Catholic. I oh. joined the Catholic Church a couple years ago. Oh. And all I have to say is, please write this book. <laughs> <laughs> um, because as an African American Catholic, we don't know that this is happening. And even as you were talking, I was talking about this needs to go to the National Black Catholic Congress, this needs to go to the Congress of Bishops because we aren't educated about this as black Catholics. We, like you said very eloquently during your whole presentation, this has been swept under the rug. Okay, Catholic Church, we're all happy. You know, this happened. Okay, we exactly. solved it. Now we all love each other. Yeah. Um, and I think one of the most powerful advocacy tools, education tools, would be this would be this book. I just, mm -hmm. even as Professor Rothbard, as you were talking, I was like, I'm so excited to read this. Um, mm -hmm. I think it would be a phenomenal teaching tool in RCIA process, which yes. is the process <laughs> I went through, um, just so that there's this awareness. Yeah. And I think coming back to the idea of the act of contrition, it may not 
you may not ever get it from the church writ large, yeah. but I think certainly the community, if it goes into this kind of book, goes toward the laity and, and RCIA and communities push this understanding, I think that will be a, go, a long way for the laity mm -hmm. to have a better understanding of what happened okay. and providing hopefully that, not necessarily recognition, but that awareness that, mm -hmm. that people like you um, um, were on the cutting edge of. So first of all, thank you. Um, and thank you for, for, for your work. And I, I really look forward to meeting you. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. I will. Uh, yeah, so uh, I, I, I like so many questions, so many things that maybe we can just like write about yourself or something. <laughs> um, yes, please hurry up and write the book. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I think that for me, I actually, I'm, I'm a newly reverted Catholic. Um, oh. I was, born and baptized Catholic and then I became a Protestant and now I moved back to D.C. and oh. rejoined the Catholic Church. Oh. Um, and I accidentally joined a black congregation at uh, Holy Comforter St. Cyprian in Capitol Hill and oh. I didn't know it was a black church mm -hmm. because we started going to 7 p.m. service and it was a mostly integrated, you know, as many white as there were black as there are Hispanic and I was thinking, yes. okay, this is a really dynamic church body. But then we started going to the morning service and I noticed it's like all African American people Mm -hmm. And me and my wife and probably 10% Caucasian people. And it there's gospel choir and it's like, and it's two hours long and like the, the preaching goes on and like it is just like going to church in the South. Yeah. And so we're like, we're home, this is it. You know, like, and so we now are, you know, parishioners at this historically black Catholic church. Mm -hmm. But as I started to realize that this was our new home, I would walk into this church and I just felt that there was a hallowed nature that I couldn't put my finger on. Like there, there's, there's like all the ties to the historical Roman Catholic Church, but there's also this like race element that I have. I do not understand that there's something sacred about what I'm doing here. And in some ways, I felt a little bit like a guest, and still do. And I think that that's because back in the South, with the you know majority Protestant population, both white and black after slavery ended and segregation <clears throat> started to emerge between churches, you know, African Americans got their churches and white people kept their churches and that continues. Right. But under the Roman Catholic onus of it's one, it's universal, that integration was forced. Yes. And, and that, that dynamic of you saying, there's this paradox between my salvation and my dignity, like, that is something that doesn't exist anywhere else in, mm -hmm. in the, the racial history of our country. And I think you have to write it, like you, you have to do this. And um, I look forward to you blowing the doors off this thing because I, I with Christy, agree like, it's, it's hard to know how to advocate if you don't understand the history. Mm -hmm. And uh, so maybe you can be the one to do that for us. Oh, well. Well, thank you. I mean, one thing I don't really, didn't really delve into this morning in my literature review, I do go into how that cath black Catholic identity formed. And it was not, um, you know, because of exclusion. It was, uh, I mean, it, 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 was be it wasn't in spite of inclusion. It was because of the exclusion that black people experienced. So this um, black, black people through slavery, you know, and you can see this in the black churches, they cohere around this idea of, um, you know, Jesus the comforter, the redeemer who came to the earth and, you know, he was persecuted, he wasn't understood, he died. And so you do hear a whole lot more of those types of overtones than, than you might in a typical Catholic church. You, you hear about Jesus the comforter, the redeemer, you know, some of the hymns are more of the, um, of that. Um, yeah, yeah tone yeah. yeah and so um yeah you can you can def definitely still have that um experience very easily we yeah. we belong to a black catholic church as well yeah i think that one it's more relatable yeah sure. i'm sorry no no uh, one of the i, I guess I, I stand a little bit against the idea of going after contrition in, in some ways okay only because um i think that during the time that you would have been a small child none of the church leadership today is still alive. Like, it's, it's unlikely that even some priests still exist that were, you know, mm -hmm. uh, 
the ones who are making those objective decisions to or subjective decisions to do that. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that might be. Um, I don't want to say it would be a waste of time because it wouldn't be. I think it's if that's something you pursued. I, I just feel like if you instead stood yourself up as a, an advocate for people who are like have are making decisions today, mm -hmm. it might be. I don't know. Better use of your time in some ways. Okay, I understand. I get that. Uh, yeah. Opposition. Yeah, I want to hear it. Yeah. Uh, in part because there's too much potency in the data, so I separate yourself from this. Mm, yeah. And just because they're dead doesn't mean that the experience doesn't still exist. Mm. And people can use the excuse that, well, it wasn't about me to continue to do the thing. That's a good point, yeah. So I think mm -hmm. part of what this is to revitalize mm. that history and, uh, and, and to force those today to understand that and to see in themselves what might have been happening then, mm -hmm. to understand that it has been institutional issues that need to be addressed. Mm -hmm. Yes. If we look at our world today, we know that's the fact of the case. Yeah. Just looking at the issues that continue to bring us to the nation, we don't sit down and say, okay, we, we have a responsibility for this. We may not be contrived, but how do we now begin to go forward? And I think that's what mm -hmm. we're talking about. Yeah, and it's almost the institution itself. I mean, if you're in Macy's and you get mistreated, you know, hopefully they're not going to say, oh, I didn't mistreat you. That the cashier mistreated you. <laughs> you said, well, you know, yeah, it's still your institution. It has your name on it. <laughs> you know, it's part of your identity. So it, it, it's not even a recompensation that I'm talking about. I'm talking about um, there, there isn't the awareness of the narrative to begin with. And then so the, if once the institution owns uh, what occurred in its past, then maybe w through dialogue with the affected um, communities, can come up with something that is connected to what occurred. I stay corrected. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree with that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. So, so thank you. Uh, this dissertation has probably been a long time coming for you. A long time. Yes. Lifelong time. Um, and I appreciate you sharing this and your role and your journey to do it. Thank um, you. I just wanted to comment on something that uh, Professor Crew and, and, and Charles said. I'm actually studying Southern Baptists and Episcopalian uh, wrestling or refusal to wrestle with racial issues and racism and white supremacy. And mm -hmm. the, the, just uh, earlier this year, the Southern Baptist Convention took a vote on whether to condemn the all right. It passed the second or third or fourth time. <laughs> so, and the Southern Baptist Convention was created in the mid 19th century as a rejection of abolition. And so, they, I, 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 I gather that there will be people who say that's not my, that wasn't my sin. Don't, don't condemn me for the sins of my father, my, my, my legacy, my, my father's legacy. And, and yet, there, there may, and I don't know how important or, or valuable an institutional expression of contrition might be. I, I don't, I can't, I can't speak to that. But there, so I, I also wanted to say that, that the Catholic Church is having its struggles, but as you know and many people know, it is, it is all over Protestantism as well mm -hmm. in this country. And so uh, mm -hmm. lots of work to be done to, to educate people who did not make, making invisible, making the invisible visible. Mm -hmm. I struggle with that because it's only invisible to certain people. Mm -hmm. To some people, it's always been visible. Yes. Um, but sometimes I think that if you write a book, you can connect with people who thought they were going through this alone. Hmm. And so they can see their story in the words. Okay. And I think that that's why this book hmm. is Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you. I just want to say clearly there's more than one book here. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we have a serious piece of it. Don't worry, it'll all happen. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay. I think you'll help me. <laughs> you'll help me. Oh. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.